Good morning. It is 11 a.m. Eastern. We will be getting started at five minutes after to allow everyone to log in and get settled. Thank you for joining us and thank you for joining us early. Hello, it is 11.02. We will be getting started at 11.05 to allow everyone to successfully log in and get settled. Thank you for joining us. We'll be getting started shortly. Hello, we will be getting started in one minute. Thank you for joining us. We'll be getting started in one minute. Good morning and thank you for joining us. 
Welcome to the Michigan Online Educator Certification System, also known as MOEX, Effectiveness Rating Training for Districts. Today, we will be joined by the Michigan Department of Education Center for Educational Performance Information, or CEPI, the Office of Educator Talent, as well as the Office of Professional Preparation Services. And again, we appreciate you all joining us. We know how busy you are gearing up for the school year, but we are glad to have you with us today. Before we get started, we want to make sure that everyone feels acclimated with technology. We recognize that webinars can be a bit impersonal, but we also recognize that it's a bit more efficient and effective with time and want to reach as many districts across the state as possible. On your screen, you should be able to see a PowerPoint. And if you make sure that the uh, webinar with Adobe Connect is your main browser, um, you will notice that slides will be progressing throughout the presentation on your screen. You do not have to press or click anything uh, to make the presentation viewable. We'll be controlling this on our end. In addition, you will be able to hear facilitators, yet all participants are listening in. You all are not connected to audio just due to participant volume, and you'll most likely notice the participant volume going up um, during the next few minutes or so as people are continuing to log on. If you have a question, we do have a chat pod. And today, we're actually going to leave the chat on um, individuals you can see each other's chat. So Harun, uh, Rashid, has, and I have been chatting, and you all have been able to see that. Uh, if you want to locate on the right side of your screen the chat box uh, and chat in hello to let us know that you found it and can chat, that's how we will be communicating to answer questions throughout uh, the presentation. So feel free. Hello. Hello, Erica, Shelly, Karen, Nancy. Ooh, I'm getting a lot of hellos. Good morning, Mary. Hi, James. Hello, Sandra. Feel free to keep chatting in there. Um, this chat box we will use throughout the presentation. We will also be utilizing this um, for Q&A, which you will notice multiple times throughout today's webinar. I also um, see some chats coming in from additional folks as well. Um, so we're glad that you located that. And if you are still trying to locate it, it just looks like a chat box on the right side of your screen. Hello from Huron Valley Schools. Hello, Joanne. Perfect. So a few additional FYIs. Uh, each webinar is being recorded, and one selected webinar will be shared with all participants after our last webinar, which is today. In addition, the materials that we review with you today, there are particularly three documents that are the meat of this presentation. Um, if you are a copious note taker or want to take screenshots, you're more than welcome to. However, we will be sharing out the three PDF documents with you immediately after today's webinar. So literally about 10 minutes after the webinar, you will see an email from me uh, that will provide you with documents that we've used today. And those documents are not like secretive or confidential. We encourage you to share those and share those widely. As I mentioned, we'll have a Q&A portion after each main section of our presentation, as well as at the end of the presentation. And lastly, you'll notice that we're using acronyms. We don't want to assume that everyone uh, uses the same language or that you, know, you have been in your role for quite some time. You might be new to your role or new to the district. Uh, there are three acronyms in particular that you'll hear pretty often over the next hour or so. Uh, first, MOEX, the Michigan Online Educator Certification System. Center for Educational Performance and Information, also known as CEPI. And the Registry for Educational Personnel, which is REP. I will also note if sound goes out during the webinar, feel free to chat in and let us know. Um, this is one of the limitations we recognize of webinars, but we will make it work and we'll do what we can. Um, so if sound goes out, feel free to just send a quick chat so we know and can get things readjusted. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to our facilitators to introduce themselves. Uh, and first, I will pass it over to Jared. Hi, I'm Jared Robinson. I'm the Educator Effectiveness Manager in the Office of Educator Talent. So our office is the office that's been dealing with the educator evaluation uh, side of the legislation uh, with the changes to legislation, rolling out guidance to districts and supports on uh, educator evaluations. And so I'll be speaking about the law uh, and how the law, um, the educator evaluation law plays into some of these certification issues today. Hi, everybody. I'm Phil Chase. I'm the supervisor of the Professional Accountability Unit in the Office of Professional Preparation Services, or OPPS. 
OPPS is also sometimes known as Teacher Certification and Preparation Office. And it's our office that uh, runs and administers the Michigan Online Educator Certification System, or MOEC. And that is a, an acronym you might know well. And uh, we'll be showing you some MOEC screens that deal with uh, seeing uh, educator ratings uh, online. Good morning, I'm Caitlin Groom and I work with CEPI, the Center for Educational Performance and Information, the lead analyst on the REP application, which is where the educator evaluation ratings are submitted originally and then also where you will be submitting those appealed ratings. And my name is Chanel Hampton. I am a consultant with the Office of Educator Talent. Uh, and you all will not be hearing my voice too much more throughout the webinar, um, but wanted to just make sure that everyone is set up logistically in terms of technology and operations. Um, and we are, again, thrilled to have you all joining us today for the next hour or so. So over the next hour or so, in terms of our objectives, we want to make sure that we're setting you all up to understand the legislation that influences educator evaluation. We also want to provide you with a preview or a view um, of the educator effectiveness ratings in MOAC. So uh, as district personnel, you cannot see the same view that your educators can see unless you are also a certified educator with effectiveness ratings as well. And so we want to give you that inside view of what educators are seeing because they'll most likely be calling you with questions. Um, and some of those questions, we also want to make sure that we're supporting you to be able to answer. So accessing their effectiveness ratings in MOEX, understanding their effectiveness ratings and the data that your educators see in MOEX when they log in, understanding the legal requirements for an appeal, submitting an appeal to the rep, Hello. And just answering answer overall general FAQs, FAQs that educators, that educators will most likely have, have and might have already been calling you with over the past couple of days. We also want to make sure that we are just in general helping prepare you and making sure that you all feel confident in supporting your educators um, as it relates to the availability of educator effectiveness ratings in MOEX. All right, in terms of our agenda, uh, we just went through logistics and introductions. Uh, there will be three key parts to this webinar, as I mentioned, and there will be three foundational documents that guide us through that, which I'll be sharing out shortly after. The first is going to be with Jared discussing action required uh, to ensure your state evaluation data is accurate for a certificate progression and renewal. We'll then be digging in with Phil around effectiveness ratings in the report and how to read that. Lastly, we will be connecting with Caitlin to discuss the educator effectiveness appeals within the Registry of Educational Personnel, or the REP. And then throughout, after each section, we will be taking Q&A, and then we'll also wrap up the webinar with Q&A, as well as next steps. So I will go ahead and pass it over to Jared to take us away with action required to ensure your state evaluation data is accurate for certificate progression and renewal. Thanks, Chanel. So I want to start off by just talking a little bit about the big picture of why uh, this conversation is necessary. Um, so when the educator evaluation law was passed last fall, it created a linkage between certification and effectiveness ratings. And districts have been submitting effectiveness ratings uh, to the rep for the past five years, uh, although the first year was optional in that collection. Um, but since there weren't a lot of high stakes um, implications for teachers, um, we know that there were big data quality issues with some of those submissions, sometimes systematic that happened at the district level, at the submission level, and sometimes just errors that were submitted. So that's, now that teacher certification is tied, we have a need to connect those. So I want to talk specifically about how teacher uh, evaluation is tied to certification, um, and, and then what are the implications for that for districts and for teachers. So. To start off, I want to talk about Public Act, uh, Public Act 173 of 2015, which is our education evaluation law. And for the first time, starting in November of last year, we have a linkage between teacher certification and effectiveness ratings that teachers get at the end of the year. And so now, because of this, 
um, we recognized that there was a need for teachers to be able to go back and check their data to make sure it was submitted accurately. Now, when CEPI collects information on the rep, they already give an, appeal, uh, an appeals window for districts, and a lot of districts have done a really conscientious job of making sure that their data is correct. And that's exactly what we want going forward. Um, but we know that there are inaccuracies. So, so when I show you, when I uh, talk through these slides, I'm going to talk through them from the teacher perspective, what the teacher is going to do. Um, this is based off of a handout that we made specifically for teachers, so you'll notice that it comes from that stance. We're going to make that handout available to you at the end of the webinar in an email. Um, you'll be able to disseminate that to your teachers. So all of the teachers are going to be able to view, and they can do it now, they can view their effectiveness labels inside of the Michigan Online Educator Certification System, or MOEX, like we're talking about um, in this webinar. And that went live on Monday. And so one of the asks that we're asking of teachers is that they review their evaluation data for the past five years to ensure that they're accurate. And so for some teachers, this comes pretty naturally because they're in the process, they're logging into MOEX anyways for an immediate certification. But we're asking that all teachers log into MOEX this summer, right now, to review their evaluation data in preparation for the certification implications that are going to continue rolling over the next several years. Um, we have a one-time window to get this right right now. So generally, at the end of each year, um, if you've been submitting this in REP, you know this, that there are four effectiveness labels based on the evaluation system that you have locally in your district. And so every uh, teacher is rated highly effective, effective, minimally, minimally effective, or effect, uh, ineffective. Um, and so I want to talk specifically um, on the next couple slides about how certification is affected by these ratings under the new legislation. So this legislation affects teachers in two groups. The first group is the group of teachers who are um, aiming to advance their certification to the Advanced Professional Certificate. Now this is a new certification. It hasn't been available um, uh, to this point, but it will be available starting January 1st of this upcoming year. So in order for a teacher to advance to this Advanced Professional Certificate, I should say progress, so I'm not repetitive, um, the teacher will need to have the right effectiveness data. They'll, they'll need to have been um, highly effective on three of the five most recent annual year-end evaluations. So you can start to see that there's a real tie between their evaluation data and their certification. Also, they could not have been rated ineffective within the five most recent years. And also, there's a, an additional training requirement or, or advanced certification requirement that comes through the National Board certifi certification um, that they can get or an approved Michigan Teacher Leader Program. So. This is true for the first time they apply for that license, then also for all renewals going into the future. So this is the first group of teachers that might be really directly affected by their effectiveness labels. There's a second group of teachers who are also uh, possibly affected by this. And this is uh, teachers who are progressing from their provisional certificate to their initial professional certificate. This actually happens on a lag. So this doesn't happen right away. Um, this happens on or after July 1st, 2018. Um, so these teachers might be applying right now for this advancement. They might be applying um, in the future, but starting in 2018, they will need to, in order to progress to this initial professional certificate, they will need to have successfully completed three years of teaching. They will we'll need to have received effective or highly effective ratings on their three most recent annual year-end evaluations, or if they don't have consecutive evaluations, um, receive three non-consecutive effective or highly effective ratings and received a recommendation for certificate progression from the current school administrator. And you know, this process is probably not um, completely unfamiliar to those of you who have sponsored a, a certification in the past under the current rules and guidelines. And, and um, our certification folks are working really hard to just make sure that those are all ironed out and as clear as possible. Now, there's a lag for this. This doesn't happen until 2018. But there's not a lag on this correction window. This correction window exists um, 
upcoming. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what the timeline, but this is a one-time collection window. Let's talk about those dates just a little bit. So for teachers, their evaluation data is now starting. Uh, it actually happened on Monday. Um, their evaluation data for the past five years is available for them to view in MOEX. So you're not, as administrators and districts, you're not going to be able to see the teacher's data in the MOEX system. So one of the purposes of this webinar is for us to give you those views that teachers are seeing so that you can really be informed as to what they're seeing that's causing them to want to communicate with you. Um, so all teachers in the state, we hope, will log into MOEX and verify that their data is accurate. Um, the second important set of dates really applies to you as district personnel, and that's this window from September 1st to December 1st of this year. This is a one-time only appeals window where districts and PSAs can submit data correction appeals to the rep for inaccurate teacher evaluation data that's been submitted for any of the past five years. So if you find that your evaluation data, is if teachers find inaccurate data, they'll work with the district. Now I want to pause here and just mention that one way that districts can know that they have inaccurate data is they get a phone call from a teacher. And if they do, they want to make sure that it actually is a data inaccuracy. They'll do some kind of audit to check their records to make sure it was inaccurate, and there will be a way for them to fix that and wrap. And Caitlin's going to talk more about that. For, for our districts who know that they have more systematic errors, um, they're going to want to download their data files and do a systematic check, data quality check. You don't have to wait for a teacher to call you. You can be proactive. Um, and, and that would be a really great thing if a teacher calls and says, oh, yes, we are aware of that ourselves. We're already, we've already have a plan to fix it. Um, so that's something that you as districts can do. In addition to getting ready for teacher calls, you can be proactive and start to look at your own data quality yourself. Um, the corrected data will appear in MOEX as it's updated in the rep. There's a little bit of lag, but it's not a big one. Um, so teachers will be able to check back and make sure that the data corrections actually happen. So this is all um, really important information for educators. It's important for districts. So in this, um, in this document that we've made for teachers, we have some things that they need to do just as a review. The first is to log on to MOEX. The second is to check their records to make sure that they have the accurate evaluation data reported contact the districts if there's a discrepancy. And we'll talk more about this, but there's a reason they contact the di districts, because we don't have any of the information to do an audit if there's a data inaccuracy to make sure it is that the correction needs to be made. All that data uh, relies on the district that submitted originally the data into REP. So that's who teachers will be working with to get the, the correction made is with the districts. Um, and then teachers need to be proactive and follow up to make sure that their data gets correct because it affects them in some possibly really uh, important ways in terms of in terms of their certification. So checking back and following up. I want to pause and uh, take some time for questions now. Yes, and we have a couple questions that have come in. Um, thank you all. Um, Justin asked, "Is MoEx only showing ratings for teachers?" Will principals and others, directors of instruction, curriculum, et cetera, not see ratings? Uh, don't most administrators also carry teacher certs? Great question, Justin. And I will pass that over to Phil. Hi there. Um, I'll take that question. Before I do, though, I just want to make sure I have a quick tech check. I switched microphones during the presentation, so if everyone can hear me. All right, I'm getting a lot of thumbs up and a lot of nodding. Plus, I'm, getting, I'm not getting any bad feedback, so I'll go ahead and answer the question. So the uh, short answer question is we're working on that. Um, we do recognize that a lot of administrators also have an educator, educator certificate, but we are limited to something in the law that defines who should, who should get a label. That law is actually uh, MCL 380.1249, and so um, I won't go into too much detail about that and bore you to death, but I will say that right now we are displaying the ratings of only the, the folks that would have had an instructional assignment or teachers. Um, later on, we will look at what, what to do with administrators, but again, the law doesn't impact them right now. It only impacts teachers. Great questions. And Erica, I see that you chatted and we, you had the same question as Justin. Um, so great minds think alike. Um, feel free to take a couple more minutes and chat in any questions you might have uh, regarding information that Jared just discussed. And I will continue to read these out and pass them over. Uh, let's see. Perfect. Erica appreciated the response. 
Eric, could I also say to your question too, you add, you listed a couple of folks there that may should have ratings based on how you see them in the classroom and things. In a couple of minutes, I'll get I'll give you a little more a more definition as to what we think what we know folks would get ratings or not. So you've got some stuff people listed there. So stay tuned a couple of minutes, and I'll get to it. Perfect. Erica says wonderful. All right. Well, thank you, Jared. Uh, we will be passing it over to Phil, um, who you all just heard speaking, to further discuss effectiveness ratings and how to read those. And again, as a reminder, we'll be sharing out three documents immediately after today's webinar um, to really walk you all through exactly the, the meat of this discussion here today. So Phil, I'll pass it over to you. All right. Thanks so much, Janelle. I really appreciate um, the, the team effort on this, as well as inviting me to uh, talk through through the MOAC screens, um, and hello to everybody out there in webinar land. Um, it's nice to uh, nice to work with you on any kind of week, anytime we can communicate to our field. It's always a pleasure. Um, in the next few slides, I'm going I'm to talk about the definitions of the opening screen that educators will see, uh, as well as some special situations, and those would include missing ratings, missing years, not having data at all, or what happens if multiple districts of ratings are reported. But before I launch into that. I just want to uh, do a couple of notes and thank Jared for a lot of the stuff that he said and back him up because it's important that you have a little bit of a context here for this. Remember, these are just screens that your educators will see. What we're trying to do is we're trying to arm you with information before it comes to you as a surprise so you know that if they see something that they're not sure how it got there or if they don't agree with it or it looks untoward or different to them, um, you'll be able to be the first line of defense on some of the answers because after all, all we're showing you is screens. All we have is the data that gets reported to us from the rep. The MOEX is not going to be the source of, a, uh, of uh, not going to be the place to, to, to log appeals. The educators will be coming to you to ask why this or why that or why did I get whatever rating. It's up to you to um, organize organize those uh, those inquiries and respond to them. Again, we're just a screen, so I want to make that clear because we're already going to be getting. We know we're going to get some calls and things like that about folks that don't understand how what they're seeing on the screen, and they're going to miss the very important note that hey, Moex is just showing you what the district reported, so go to them. So that one note. Uh, another note is that what can get confusing in this whole thing is we're actually not dealing with one group of educators, we're really dealing with two because the law specifically broke out two different kinds of educators. One, folks that are going from the provisional to the professional and another, folks that want to acquire the advanced professional certificate. And it's important to remember that there are different, similar but different rules that apply to each group. The reason why I'm telling you that up front is because on the next screen, you're going to see a bunch of data. So here's a bunch of data that your educators will see. Remember, you won't be able to see it. It's what your educators see. Your educators will see, your teachers will see a list of where they worked, as well as the years they worked there, and then the ratings they would have gotten. But it's not so simple because if they are intending to apply for the provisional certificate, they have different requirements under the law as if that if than what they would have if they are applying for the advanced professional. So Jerry did a great job of breaking that out. And again, you're going to be able to access this, this webinar afterwards so you can review it. Um, I won't do a lot of review on that unless you want me to. But I will say that there's some timing in here. Since the current professional, uh, since the current um, provisional certificate holders who would like to progress to the, prof to the professional won't be able to do so under this, uh, well, won't need to do so with the educator evaluation until after July 2018, they have a little bit of time. And this is important to know because the folks that will probably want to use this system and use these ratings are the ones that are applying for the advanced professional because they can do so already January 1, 2017. So I would encourage you to go back to the webinar and make sure you know which group, what teacher comes to you uh, with what intention because that will be important for the timing. Um, but all teachers now will be able to see this screen after they pass the demographic screens. As one further note, we've made some recent enhancements on the MOAC screens so that what they will see is they will automatically be asked to update their demographics if needed or confirm those demographics. That's also important because, believe it or not, we're getting some calls saying, hey, where's my old screens? Well, you'll get to the old screens as soon as you <laughs> confirm those demographics. So important note, but, you know, people want to know what to expect. 
Then what we'll do is we'll take them right to that rating screen. The rating screen here you can see is going to list, list a number of different pieces of information. Obviously school year, district, rating, date, and rating seems self-explanatory, except you'll notice that on the rating on the far right-hand column, uh, educators can actually click on their rating to get a box that pops up to show them their history. Why do we, why do we create that enhancement? Because we knew that you might be talking to in, individual teachers or groups of teachers in some cases as you go through that process that Jared mentioned of doing that proactive check through you, all of your data. Also, you might have individual educators that say, hey, my data still isn't right. How do they know? Because they just looked at MOEX. So you might take in appeals and you might see their, you might agree with them and then change it. Educators have to know how their ratings change from one step to the next. If they don't, they won't think that they've been changed, you see. So you can always encourage your educators. If they said, hey, you gave me an effective and it really was highly effective and then you changed it, you can always encourage them to look back at the history box to confirm that change. So that's, a, that's kind of a big note. Seems kind of like a small box, but I, I think it can do a lot for, as you converse with your own educators, you have to be able to know what they're seeing and when they're seeing it. Okay, so the next, few, the next slide is the first of, well, we had like four planned, four special situations. This one's about missing ratings. You'll actually notice that in this sample educator's view, they were listed as being uh, employed at a certain district, but they have no rating. Now, how could that be? Actually, that's quite possible. Some educators or some teachers come into the profession, they might have been subbing for a year, or they might have been in what we call a non-instructional position. They might have been a parapro. There are, some, there are many situations where they would not have gotten a rating because the law, once again, that's Michigan Compiled Law 380.1249, did not define them as someone who would have gotten a rating. So it's important that you review that law, but also important that you know upon which basis they may be claiming they are missing or not, because then you can help us and yourselves in getting the right answers to your teachers. So again, um, it might have been because they were in a non-instructional role. You'll also notice on the screen we include another situation. It might have also been because for the first two years of the educator evaluation law um, that we had, um, reporting of ratings were, was voluntary. So a school district, maybe not yours, maybe a past one, just decided not to report ratings that year. And so it looks like they have missing ratings even though they were employed as a teacher. So again, it's important for you to understand the world of possibility so that you can better address uh, each educator's needs. The next screen deals with uh, a, missing, a missing year. Um, on this screen, you'll notice that it looks like all the ratings are fine, but hang on, they're missing the 2013-2014 school year. Why would that have happened? Well, here we've got some sample, we've got, we've got some examples. First of all, they might not have been employed with a district at all. They might have taken a year off. They might have been on a maternity or administrative leave or some other, something else that caused them not to be in a, employed or to, at least to not be in a classroom and then their, their year was skipped. Um, now, of course, I'm, I'm talking extemporaneously. I don't exactly know. This is only a sample. You'd have to, of course, chase that down with an individual a teacher. Um, again, for a non-instructional position, we may not even pick up that year because they work completely in a different, a different atmosphere at your school. Or the district just didn't report them as employed for whatever reason. Again, we won't know. All we have is the records from uh, uh, CEPI and the rep to load up onto our screens, which is why it's very important. You're going to hear Caitlin tell you this a little later. Why it's very important to get the cleanest data possible. Um, so that's a thing that can happen. The next situation that we can happen is that educators could have no data at all. Now, why would that be? Well, a myriad of reasons. Maybe they're a new teacher that's just coming into the state. Maybe they're, again, they only were employed those first two years when ratings were optional, and now they're coming back to the teaching force. There could be a lot of reasons. Um, it could also be, unfortunately, that a, that a district was completely remiss in reporting their teachers. This happens very rarely, but, you know, stuff happens. So. If, if you have an educator that sees no data, they're going to see a screen that looks like this. Finally, we also thought about this possibility. Well, you could have multiple districts in the same year. 
Clearly that can happen because I might have worked part of, part of a year in District A and part of a, a year in District B. And so you're going to have multiple ratings that way. Hopefully those ratings won't conflict, but you may have situations where one rating is different from the other rating that was reported in the same year. We had a question in yesterday's webinar that was, well, what happens if they're not the same rating? Which one do you use for what purpose? Fortunately, I can tell you. Um, I can tell you that if you if you are a teacher that's progressing um, that's progressing from the provisional to the professional education certificate, we're going to use the higher of the two ratings. And the reason why is because the law says that we have to have um, for the three consecutive school years uh, a highly effective or effective. So as long as they're highly effective or effective, we're going to take the better of the two ratings. Because honestly, why wouldn't we? That's what we can, that's what a district considered the teacher's performance to be, and so we're going to believe that district. However, for teachers that are applying for the advanced professional certificate, if we have two ratings that are different, we're going to take the lower. And the reason why is because the law states that they can't have any ineffectives within the last five years. They have to have three of five, the last three of the five have to be highly effective. So to err on the side of fulfilling the law, we're going to take the lower of the two ratings. Again, in most situations, probably won't be a problem. But it, that is to say, if it's a teacher that is a teacher leader and is going through one of those teacher leader programs, I'm sure that those are teachers that would have no problem being reported as highly effective. However, if you have a discrepancy, you should know the source of the discrepancy. Um, so I whipped through those uh, four or five slides pretty quickly, and I bet there's questions. Um, I'll wait for a minute to see if there's some questions because I think there's a lot of nutsy bolty issues out there. And we have a few questions that have already came in. Um, oh, if you are still chatting while we're posing these questions, um, if you're just joining us, there is a chat box in the right hand side of your screen. Um, you can chat in your question there and we will be sure to get to it. Um, so we have a few questions that have been posed. Uh, Shelly Kennedy asked, how will the exempt 09 ratings show up in MOEX? Great question. Great question. Yeah, great question. I think we're going to give that to Caitlin, right? Yes, and I'll pass it over to Caitlin. That is a great question. So I believe that they will show up as an 09 exempt. Um, you do have the option to go into the rep and make that a highly effective or whatever rating. Obviously, if they're being reported with that highly effective exemption, um, they would have been rated highly effective. So um, if they wish to correct that to an 01 instead of the 09, the rep authorized user would have the ability to do that within the appeals process. But it, it will be pulled in as the 09 exempt. Thanks, Caitlin, and thanks for that question, Shelley. Uh, we had a question come in from Erica Wiltz. Pardon if I'm mispronouncing your last name, Erica. Um, are those individuals who are exempt due to three years of highly effective reported without a rating or reported as exempt? And I'll pass this over to Caitlin again. So we kind of touched on this in the question before. Um, so they would show up as the exempt rating. Um, for certification purposes, that is, and, and all of the reporting that, that CEPI does with that data, it is pulling in as a highly effective code. So um, we are considering that highly effective, even though it is you know, a different code within the system um, that's as good as being highly, highly effective for that school year. Thanks again, Caitlin, and thank you for that question, Erica. Jason asked, are the superintendent, principal, and assistant principal considered instructional according to the law? And I will pass that question over to Jared. Thanks for the question. Um, so for the purposes of what we're talking about today, the answer is no. That, um, that their certification is not tied to their ratings. However, the law does make a distinction between administrators um, at the school, district, and even ISD level who oversee instructional matters at the school. Um, those are ones who receive 1249 evaluations for administrators as well. Um, they're, res they're required under law to receive administrators. But um, these are, that's not the population of folks that we're talking about today. 
Great question, Jason. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jared. And we had another question come in from Elizabeth Crimmins. Uh, GSRP teachers, the rep reports a warning if they are reported with a teaching certificate and no effectiveness. Do they need to be reported? And I'll pass this over to Caitlin. That is a great question, Elizabeth. So um, the I'm, I'm not sure I'm totally clear on this, so I may need to follow up with you after the webinar has concluded. Um, so if it's a true warning, warnings can be submitted without preventing you from reporting the effectiveness rating. Um, I believe that the system is set up to you know, require the effectiveness ratings for all of those assignment codes that we have determined instructional. So I'm not really sure, like there's no real way to get around reporting it if it is a required in assignment code. Um, so if, if that doesn't really answer your question, we can, we can follow up with you after that. Thanks. And Julie, I saw that you said you had a similar question as Elizabeth regarding early childhood and early on teachers. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Jared. I think he has some thoughts here. And Julie, feel free to type in if you have like a supplemental question as well, and we will definitely get to that. Right. Uh, so this is one of the things that we're actually actively seeking clarification on from, uh, from our council looking at the law, because uh, the way that we look at it, it doesn't look like there's a requirement that uh, evaluations be submitted under 1249 for GSRP um, pre-K teachers. So um, this leads us to questions about what, how their certification structure is affected by that. And we're, this is a problem that we are actively thinking about and working about. We don't have a, an official answer for you on that, how the certification is tied. But um, I imagine that a lot of you are thinking about it in some of the same ways that we're thinking about it the state. And, and uh, it's something that we've got our our best people thinking through the issues and trying to find a solution that is best for everyone involved. Yes, great question, and thank you, Phil and Jared. Um, Jason has a question, Jason Kennedy. And Jason's question is, if the principal is not considered instructional, so effectiveness ratings do not show in MOEX, and the principal has a teaching certificate, will there be an impact to the principal being able to renew or advance their teaching certification? Oh, possibly. Yes, the answer to that is possibly. So for renewing the professional certification, if you already have your professional certificate, the law does not actually do any linkages of your evaluation data to that. So for principals who already have a professional certificate, they can continue to renew that in perpetuity just with the requirements that are in rule for renewal of that certification as if there was no change. Um, now, for principals who are interested um, in keeping their teaching certificate but have not yet advanced the professional, um, this is a group that might be affected in some ways. Um, we are working on this. I know one of the things that uh, we're working on um, is thinking about that, that initial provisional certificate and how many times it can be renewed. We don't have anything official to announce on that, but um, you know, the, this is one of the ways that we see that we have some wiggle room to provide for exactly situations uh, like you're talking about. So we're thinking about that as well as alternate routes. And Phil's going to talk, I think, a little bit more about that. Okay, we just got a quick note that the audio was lost. So if you all can chat in, if you can hear me, 
Um, can you all hear me right now? Okay, perfect. Um, I am going to go ahead and pass uh, my, perfect. Okay, so we are going to have Phil kind of restart that last batch of comments that he shared. And thank you so much for using the chat box all um, to let us know that you could not hear us. So I'll pass it back over to you, Phil. Thanks, everybody. I'm sorry. We're sorry about that technical issue. I think everyone can hear me okay now. Great, great. Um, what I was saying was, I was just backing up Jared's, um, what Jared was saying by saying this. Again, it's, uh, in, what I'm about to say is, about, is not official, but I wanted to say that we are sensitive to the disenfranchise, the possible disenfranchise, disenfranchisement of any educator who would not normally gain a label but needs to gain a label in order to either advance professional or gain the advanced professional. So we are actively thinking about that. And by the way, we always love feedback and suggestions here. But um, what I can say is we are considering um, asking for uh, either amendment to rule or for a superintendent's waiver to do something like make one or both tiers uh, renewable ad infinitum so that you don't lose your certificate. We would never want that to happen as a result of the law. Remember, those people who make the laws are, you know, they have, they have a certain goal in mind, but they may not always have all of the possibilities in mind. That's why we have administrative rules so that we can go ahead and execute those laws. So. I'm telling you that not because I want you to go and say this is the thing we're going to do, but I want you to know that we're sensitive to this and in the months that come, we need to get situations like this so that we are armed with, with recommendations to our leadership. Thanks, Phil. I, I, I hope that's a good non-answer. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Phil. And we had a couple other questions come in, so I have three that I'm going to pose. Uh, the first was from Julie Lawless, and Julie said, we're struggling because we understand that early childhood are not eligible for tenure, but they hold a valid teaching certificate. So we're trying to figure those things out. And I'll pass that over to Jared. And I'll say thank you for thinking about that. And, and you know, we welcome your, your input on that. We think, we're thinking about it as well. I don't, I don't have, like, a great answer other than I know what, that the legislation doesn't require an evaluation for them. I know that they, uh, you have the option of uh, having evaluations for them that can be submitted in the rep. Um, uh, you know, the system that you use is not mandated by law, but um, you could use a, an observation tool that was the same for your other teachers. It's worth looking at your observation tool and asking yourself, is it appropriate for, for early learners? Um, there is some research suggesting that some of the tools are better not used for early learners. So that's a question that um, depends on what tool you're, you're looking at and how you're using it. Is it, is it appropriate for, for these GSRP teachers, for example? You know, that's a question I don't have an answer for, but um, it sure makes me feel happy that you're thinking about it. Thanks, Jared. And thank you for that question, Julie. Um, Elizabeth Crimmins uh, asked, do, do year-long substitutes need an evaluation? So my understanding is that uh, if they are the teacher of record, they do, and that um, there's an, their assignment code will make it so that they can have that evaluation reported in the rep. And that's different, as you've noted, as you've um, hinted in your question, for year-long subs than it would be for day-to-day uh, -day subs or short-term subs who don't um, get an evaluation label. Um, but yes, year-long subs are the teacher of record, and there's a code for them, an assignment code, and a effectiveness rating that's required for that. Thanks, Jared. And we also had a question from Erica. Erica asks, if a principal comes to us and wants to have their ratings reported in MOAX, will we be able to submit an appeal? And I'm going to pass this over to Caitlin uh, to answer for us. And I'm passing it over here. been working with OPPS and, and the MDE teams to determine which um, of the instructional assignment codes will be allowed to submit those appealed ratings. Um, so at this time, it is my understanding that they would not be able to submit appeals for principal's ratings. Um, however, they could view the data or the authorized user for rep could view the data that has been submitted for that principal in you know, their, their rep submissions. 
Thank you for that question, and thank you for that answer. Uh, Julie asked, what if they, uh, regarding substitute teachers, um, what if substitute teachers cover for just a period of the school year and have a valid teaching certificate? Should they be evaluated? Uh, she put, regarding subs, i.e. maternity leave. This is not dissimilar to some of the questions that we've uh, encountered in past years, right? Because this is a this is a common question: is does my subbing experience um, count for certification? And the same kinds of principles and guidelines that, that govern decisions and policies under that question before the legislation, I think, govern some of the same things here. If they are not the teacher of record, um, then 1249 doesn't apply to them. Um, so specifically, we're looking at teachers of record. So in a long-term sub, does that make them the teacher of record? If it does, then they do get an evaluation. And if it doesn't, then they don't. And, and, and those same questions will carry over to the certification questions. It's a really good question to be thinking about. Thanks, Jared. And thanks for that question also, Julie. So want to just pause for a second. Good. Julie said that was very helpful. Um, so want to pause to see if we've maybe missed any questions in the chat. Feel free to rechat those in. Um, or if you have any additional questions, um, particularly relating to just bringing it back to Phil and, and just uh, MOEX in, in the effectiveness ratings and how your educators will be viewing those within the system. So we'll just pause for a few seconds here and see if we have any last questions come through before we pass it over to Caitlin to talk us through the wrap. All right, and so we are going to go ahead and pass it over to Caitlin to discuss educator effectiveness appeals within the Registry of Educational Personnel. And again, if you were in the midst of typing a question, feel free to chat it in. We will still get to it during our next Q&A segment. Here you go, Caitlin. Thank you, Chanel. So as we've discussed, you know, the teachers will come to you as the district representatives and, and have issues with their effectiveness ratings as they were submitted within the, the end of your rep collections. So um, I'm going to walk you through the process of how you would go through that, that appeals process. And again, this is a special window for as a result of the new law. So this is not something that will be happening year after year after year. This is kind of a one chance to get it right this time. Um, of course, after after we've given the correction window for the, the regular rep submission. Um, because this is related to the new law, related to educator effectiveness, you won't be able to, to appeal any other data that was submitted in that end of your collection. It's only the educator effectiveness ratings. So in the examples that Phil provided before, if you have a teacher that's missing data for a year because they were not submitted with an instructional assignment code, you will not be able to add an, an instructional assignment code to that school year, um, thus resulting in you know that they won't be able to submit uh, an educator effectiveness rating for that applicable year. Um, again, this is for the last five years of data. So now is the chance to get any corrections made to those last five years. Um, we're really recommending that you, you have an authorized user for the rep. Um, they're the people that are submitting the, the normal rep. that we okay. can we hear me now all right so if you are the rep authorized user we're really recommending that you be the district contact for teachers to come to because you will be the person that will be able to make those appealed ratings within the rep application again those dates should sound really familiar um, that the the appeals can be submitted in September 1st through the December 1st is the normal rep submission window so if you are the rep user, that should sound familiar. Um, again, with the example that Phil provided before, if you, were submit, if you have a teacher that was submitted in multiple districts, um, they will need to go to each of those respective districts to make an appeal rating for those, those years. So you will only be able to appeal data that was originally submitted by your district. Okay, so once you realize and, and find that you need to submit an appealed rating, you're going to access the rep application. You can do that um, if you are the rep user. I'm sure many of you have that page bookmarked in your favorites. Um, 
maybe not so favorites, but you can also access it from the, the CEPI webpage at michigan.gov slash CEPI, C-E-P-I. And then you'll log in. So as an authorized user, you should have your MISA account and log in, and that's what you will access the rep with. Within the main rep page, you're going to look under the personnel search and, and find that there and click personnel search. And that'll bring up the, the search options there for you. Um, of course, you can search by any of the core data there that it lists as search options. However, I'm really strongly recommending that you search by the employee's PIC number. As the rep user, you sh should have access to that. You can look in your personnel submitted to confirm that. Um, also, your teacher should have that. It's listed within the MOEC. So if you can't find it, they, they can provide it for you. Um, of course, in this example here, if you search John Smith, you're going to find many, many, many John Smiths, and you'll have to sift through all of those to find your John Smith. If you're searching by pick, you will only have one result, and it'll make it a lot easier for you to locate your actual employee. So as an authorized user of the rep, there's two different roles. You can be a data submitter or a pick search option. Um, if you have pick search, you will not see this update button in the search results. You will see a different button that says view. Um, that entails that you won't be able to make any updates to the data, but you can view the data that was submitted by your district. If you click on a person who does not have, has never been submitted by your district, they don't belong to you, um, you will get a message that says, based on the pick submitted, you do not have proper security access to the district level data, or there's no data to display. So you will also get that message for anybody that was reported with all non-instructional positions. Um, if you're looking at maybe your maintenance man, you won't see any educator effectiveness labels there. So once you find your employee, you'll want to confirm that core information again, and then click that update button. So once you click update, you'll see the screen here. It will display all of the educator effectiveness labels that have been submitted by your district, as well as the assignment code and type of credential that they were submitted with. So in kind of the middle of each school year, you'll see the current rating. And that is what was submitted by your district. So in the end of your collections, where that's actually a required field, um, that's where that's pulling from. So if you have to make a change to any of that data, you've confirmed that, yes, indeed, we did submit that with inaccurate data, um, you'll click that Change To button. And that's a drop-down that will display the four different values for educator effectiveness labels. Um, so you just select the label that, that the appealed rating should be. And if you have multiple years to correct, you can correct all of those multiple years and then go down to the bottom and click Save. Um, obviously, that's a really important step. If you don't click that Save button, you will have to re-enter all of those, those values. So just selecting it in the drop-down doesn't, doesn't actually save it to the system. And once you do save that data, MOEX is not updated immediately. It will take some time for it to be refreshed within MOEX. But once you do make those changes and you've clicked Save and MOEX has been refreshed, you will want to encourage your teachers to confirm that, that those ratings are now updated within the MOEX. So that's um, what Phil was hinting to, you know, that hyperlink they can click on to view the previous ratings that they were submitted with. So you want to be sure that, that they are going back in to, to confirm that. Once you click Save, the page will refresh. It won't take you to a different page. This is your chance to confirm that you submitted the accurate appealed ratings for that, for that teacher. So under Current, you will see what has been submitted right then, right when you did it. And then in the far right column, it says Previous Educator Effectiveness Ratings. That's what it was before you submitted the appeal. So you'll want to make sure that you, you submitted the, the accurate rating there. If you made a mistake and selected a, a, another label, you can go back and change it again, and it'll just show that those histories there. So that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts of how to submit those appeals, and we'll open it up for questions. Thanks, Caitlin.
And if you have any questions, feel free to chat those into the chat box. If you have not used the chat box yet, it should be on the right side or right area of your screen. Um, and if you can go ahead and chat in questions, we will be more than happy to answer those. And again, uh, I was chatting throughout Caitlin's presentation and throughout the entire webinar. We will be sharing out materials immediately after as well. Um, so I know a couple of folks were saying they're really looking forward to the three documents. They are extremely helpful, um, but we also want to take advantage advantage of our time together on the line today. So if you have any questions, feel free to take a minute or two and chat those in, and we would love to answer those. Is this, so Robin Beyer, I believe, I'm sorry Robin if I'm mispronouncing your last name, um, is this the only open time to make corrections? I will pass it over to Caitlin. At this time, we are only looking for this one-time correction window, um, so I, I wouldn't put your eggs in the basket of hoping for another opportunity. This is really your, your one chance for, for teachers to view the data and also for the rep users to submit those appeals. Yeah, I'll just add, you know, that's one of the reasons why we tried this, try to get as many educators' eyes on this as possible because, um, because every teacher um, you know, who could possibly be affected by this might not be naturally logging into MOEX over the course of their summer this year. So to get as many of them as we can to examine their data is really, really important. And the other thing I'll add is that, you know, this is not normal course of business for CEPI. They really value um, getting the data right the first time with a normal corrections appeal window, and then once we've reported data to keep it the same. And, and this is an institutional value. So um, opening this up is really unprecedented, and we're really thankful to them for all the work they've done because we know it's high stakes for our teachers. Uh, and we need to do our part by, by doing the heavy lift to make sure we get it right during this one time corrections appeal. Speaking of, and I don't know if my microphone's working. Okay, but speaking, I was just going to back you up on one thing there, uh, Jared. Speaking of getting all the educators' eyes on the system, we've only just this week begun to send out batches of emails to the order of 30,000 at a time to all of the uh, MOEX users we have currently on file. And that's 134, 135,000 teachers total. So you can imagine that we're going to get waves of teachers hopefully reading their emails <laughs> and going, oh boy, I better go on MOEX and look at my stuff. We get some teachers that are normally doing that anyway because they're, up, they're applying for a renewal, whatever they need to do. However, we also know there are a lot of teachers that just don't know this or aren't aware. Uh, once, that's another reason why we're giving these this series of webinars so that you can arm them with that knowledge. But the information went to you all first. It's now just going to the teachers. So we need you to help sort of back up our messages here and make sure your teachers have read their emails and understand that they can now see these ratings on MOEX. Phil and Jared. Uh, thank you for that question, Robin. Um, I don't see any other questions, but we could have missed a couple. Um, feel free to, again, take a few seconds and chat in if you have any questions, or take a look at your chat box and see if you have a question sitting there and just need to click Enter. OK, Elizabeth asks, did teachers receive an email to check this, or should we be letting them know? And I will pass that. Yep, both and. Uh, I would actually say both, because we're just now batching out our emails to teachers. Um, but you, none of this is, uh, as uh, Chanel said at the beginning of, 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 our, of our meeting today, uh, none of this is private information. It's so all should be publicly shared. Go ahead and tell your teachers about this. You kind of know it from your angle. Uh, did I lose audio again? Okay, good. Um, the, uh, the you're you're seeing thing. We're we're telling you what teachers are seeing from their angle, so you are better in a position to go ahead and tell them. But we know that it's the end of August. You're now meeting with your teachers for professional development. You're doing some opening cer ceremony stuff that you're doing at your districts. Go ahead and tell them that. Um, use uh, the the materials we're going to be distributing as well as a PowerPoint. Feel free to do that. Just back up our message with your people, and we can all live in a happy land. Uh, I also love the happy land, as you put it, Phil, uh, that uh, Erica and her district are getting to. So Erica shared, we sent out an email with how we'd like them to submit appeals to us, directions, and an appeals form. Excellent, Erica. Yeah, that's really great. 
Great. And, uh, you know, when we send out an e-blast and, and creating the document for teachers, um, you know, we, we submit it, we attach a link to that in the e-blast. It's the same document that you'll be getting um, today. So really, um, I think that many of our teachers need different avenues to get information to them. Um, and, and so if, if a teacher gets the information twice, that's not as bad as them getting it no times. So, um, I, so I'm getting happy because in the chat box, Elizabeth said she would love to see that form. Um, so Elizabeth and uh, Erica, potentially you two, you can share your email addresses in the chat box with one another. Um, I, I, I love the cross-district collaboration, um, so I will let you two, you know, take that from there. Um, and so, yes, I'm, I'm loving the chat. Um, thanks, Erica. And so there will be another opportunity for questions as well. Um, while we're sharing some contact info in the chat box, um, I'm going to just return to our objectives. Um, so we've spent uh, about an hour or so together wanting just to make sure we're helping you all to understand the legislation that influences educator evaluation, um, and also just linking this to what this means for our effectiveness ratings in MOEX. We want to make sure that we're helping and supporting you all um, so that you can support your educators within your district to access their educator effectiveness ratings in MOEX, to actually understand the effectiveness ratings and the data that they're seeing when they log into MOEX, uh, understanding the legal requirements for handling an educator appeal, submitting that appeal to the rep, and just answering overall general FAQs. And overall, the real intent of this webinar is just to help you all feel prepared and confident uh, in supporting your educators as it relates to the availability of educator effectiveness ratings in MOEX, and just overall understanding the law. So in terms of what to expect, what can you all expect? So today, uh, immediately after this, you're going to receive an email from me, which includes uh, three soft copy documents that you'll notice were the foundational uh, or, or the meat to the presentation today. Uh, and that will also include soft, uh, soft copy of documents as well as links to our website. Uh, again, these are not secretive, confidential documents. Share them. Share them widely and freely within your district, with friends in other districts, um, with your educators. Uh, we think they are very helpful FAQ documents. Um, and also in the chat, I know y'all are eager to get those. Um, today through August 23rd, which is today, uh, this is our last webinar. So immediately after this, as I said, we'll be sharing out information. And we're also going to be sharing out a recording um, that we are going to get transcribed as well for accessibility purposes. And so today, you'll be getting those three documents. I'll also be sharing out the PDF of the PowerPoint. Um, and we're also working on getting a copy of the webinar transcribed for for your convenience as well. Um, if you're someone who processes and needs to listen to a webinar again, you'll have that available. Uh, if you also need those documents, you will literally have those within about 10 minutes. Uh, the MOAX data is live now, so your educators can go in and see their last five years of data. Um, and you might already be getting a couple calls about that as well. Today through September 1st, uh, we want to make sure uh, that we're supporting you all and that you all within your districts are creating those specific plans uh, to support your appeals process. Um, so as Erica said, um, you know, sending an email out to uh, inform your educators how to submit appeals in an appeals form, make sure that after this webinar you're connecting with the person or persons um, to really set up this process for success in your district. And we're not uh, overseeing or provide one you know, regimented uh, process. We recognize you know, different capacity uh, constraints, different needs, different systems, processes, and educators within each district. So you're able to really set this process up in a way that's unique um, and responsive to your needs in-house. And then September 1st through December 1st, again, districts and PSAs can submit those data correction and appeals um, through the rep. And this window, if you are the person that handles the rep or someone else, um, should be familiar. This typically is the rep window. Um, but again, just reiterating that we're opening this particular data correction and appeals process, just being aware of um, the new law that's in place and how implications of just having accurate data um, are, are heightened even further. So once again, we wanted to just return to see if there were any additional questions. Um, I'm seeing some chats of sharing some information, um, and I love this. Um, so feel free to add those in there, um, and so so you all can share documents as well. Um, but other questions uh, around content, thoughts, um, feel free to type those in.
and I'll give you a, a minute or two to type in any questions if you have them. Okay, so Erica, I was just looking at the chat and I, I'm uh, f feeling your, oh my goodness. So Erica, if you actually want to send um, your information to me, I can put that in our follow-up email. Uh, the, yeah, the document. Um, I can put that in my follow-up email so that it's a resource um, for all districts if they want to take a look at it. Um, to be clear, I'm not trying to like take the power away from you or anything. I'm just also trying to be helpful. You might be a little bit overwhelmed by coming in. Um, so I'll just put this out there, not only to Erica, but to anyone. If you have any documents, resources, etc., that you want to share um, today, uh, I can share those out um, in my follow-up email. If you don't get them to me today, you get them to me another day, I will be also sharing out a version of the transcribed email as well, and I can just put it in that catch-all email. Um, so bottom line is if you want some help, if you're feeling overwhelmed about all the email addresses coming in, feel free to share some resources with me, and I'll put them in my email as well. And let me just go back up here. Um, the chat box is blowing up in a good way with collaboration. Um, if you have a question specifically for any of us as facilitators, oh, Kim, great. OK, let me go up. So I saw a question from Kim. I saw another question, and I'll come back to that as well. Kim asked, can we view educator effectiveness if we are looking at new? And Kim, I'll pass that over to Jared to answer. Yeah, uh, there's not a way that, that um, districts share effectiveness ratings. You don't have access to the rep reports from other districts. Um, and we don't publish individual teachers' data, although I understand why you would ask that question. But the answer is no. question. And again, the chat box is blowing up a bit, so I, I want to make sure I didn't miss any questions. If you have a question that you chatted in and we somehow missed it, um, feel free to just re-chat it in. Um, I see one more, and I can see part of it about a report with the listing of teachers by building with their evaluation ratings, so we can provide to the administrators to verify. I'm going to pass this over to Caitlin. Great question. That is a great question. So we can definitely look at adding that functionality into the rep um, in the future. For now, there is not a true report that displays all of the educator effectiveness ratings that your educators were submitted with. However, you can download the rep data file. That's an option within the main rep page on their, under the reports menu. Um, and you can select any of the end of year collections for as long as data has been submitted within the rep. So um, that does download as an XML file. So if you do a save as rather than open it directly, you can open that within Excel as an XML table. It makes it really nice and user friendly for you to be able to filter for those educator effectiveness ratings that were submitted. And again, we can look at what we stuff of it. Question. Oops, OK. Seeing lost audio. Can you hear me? Hello? OK, can you all okay, hear, can you all hear me? Hello? OK, all right, if all you hear can me? hear me, if you can type in. All right, if you can hear me. All right, if you can hear me, if you can. in. Uh, I apologize for the technical difficulties. Okay, perfect. Uh, 
All right. Uh, if you can chat I'm in, so, um, you are I apologize for the technical. Perfect. All right, so um, I saw a chat that you all did not hear most of Caitlin's response due to technical difficulties. Um, and the question was, is there a report that we can share with um, teachers and their ratings with our administrators? So I'm going to pass it back over to Caitlin uh, to answer again. And again, apologies about the technical difficulties. All right, so for the educator effectiveness, there is not a report that would display all of that data in, in a very usable way. Um, however, you can download any of the rep data files for any and all of the end of year collections um, for as long as rep data has been submitted within the rep. So um, to do that, it's under the reports option in the main rep page. Um, you, it does download as an XML file, so that's not very user friendly, but if you choose the save as option rather than opening it directly, you can open it within Excel and it opens as an Excel table. It's really nice and user friendly. You can filter that to any of your um, educator effectiveness ratings. You can filter it by assignment code, by building, um, all sorts of functionality that you can do within that or do with that within Excel. Um, and we can always look to add a future report that would provide that building level summary. Um, it's not something that we would have available for this school year. However, we can look to add it in the future. Awesome. Thanks, Caitlin. And thank you for that question. Want to just take, again, one last opportunity for any questions. All right, and again, Erica, I know I'm, I'm calling you out here a little bit in a good way, um, but if you would like me to share that information, feel free to send it over to me in an email in like the next 15 minutes or so, and I can share it out. Um, if you want to directly share it with folks, that's also completely fine as well, just offering to be a resource. I put you, perfect, thank you. Um, so again, uh, we really just appreciate you all taking the opportunity to join us today um, and just engaging. I, I had fun looking at the chat box uh, and helping facilitate today. Uh, as always, thank you all for all that you're doing for educators and our students throughout the state. Um, and we will hang on the line in case you have any last questions you want to put in the chat box. Um, as I mentioned, uh, shortly after this webinar, you will be receiving resources via email from me. Um, and again, just thank you so much for joining us. We hope this was a good use of time. Um, and we look forward to working with you all this academic year. So have a great day or a great afternoon. Uh, and thank you so much.